morning, how are you? Okay, you guys ready to worship? I, I am, yeah, let's all stand up, we'll, we'll, we'll worship together. Heavenly Father, we welcome you in this place, Father. Uh, also, Father, we come with a heart of worship. Father, as we come together in your presence, Father, be glorified in this place, Father. It's not because we our lips are worthy, praise your great name, Father, uh, but you use our sinful lips to lift up your great name. So, Father, be the, be the center of everything that we do this morning, be the reason why we, why we are here. Lord, we love you. With everything that we have, we praise your name. Powerful name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. Amen.
Our God is strong in battle. Our God can never fail. Through Him all chains are broken. In Him the sick are healed. In the name of Jesus, giants are defeated. Every single mountain has to move. Faithful to your promise, finish what you started. There is love as powerful as you, Jesus. Jesus. 
So when I fight, I fight on my knees. When my hands lift it high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you.
Good morning, good morning, church family. How are you this morning? Talkative, I love it. Well, first of all, I just want to say welcome to, if we have any new visitors here this morning, we want to welcome you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we have a gift for you, actually, right back there at that table. If you want to stop by there um, on your way out and grab one of those, those are for you. There's a card in there we call it our connect card because we want to be able to connect with you if you would fill that out and leave it with the person there or you can drop it in the tithe box back there um yeah and if you have any prayer requests this is this is for all of you we also have some connect cards in that little stand back there so if church family you have any prayer requests or Here's another thing. If you guys have any, anyone has any ideas about how to reach out to our community, um, we want to hear about that also. And you can put that in that prayer section as well and stick it in the box. Let us know what your ideas, your thoughts are, how we can come alongside you to make it happen. Uh, we would love to do that. So put that in there. If you're online, welcome. If you're new, welcome, welcome. Two welcomes for you. Um, we have a Connect card you can find on our website and on our app as well. Uh, so if you would like to fill that out, we can um, get to know you a little better. We'd love to do that. We'd love to pray for you. Um, so um, also, you can use those Connect cards to, if you have a change of email, a change of address, or anything like that, please keep us updated. So our files will be updated, especially when it comes tax time and people say, I didn't get my, um, my giving statement. Well, we might have not had an updated email for you um, or address, so make sure you keep that updated for us, okay? All right, um, with that, let's see, we have a few announcements. <laughs> I think the list keeps get, getting longer every week with our announcements. Um, so please, uh, if you have not downloaded our app, please download our app because all of the announcements are on there uh, with all the details and links to register for things and all that is on our app, so please, Download the app. Um, that will save lots of your questions, I'm sure. So I will give you some of those announcements. Now, um, the first one is this Saturday, there's going to be a children's ministry meeting. So if you have ever considered helping with the children's ministry, uh, please be at that meeting. It'll be at 1 o'clock at our church offices. Not here, but at our church offices. Address is on the app. Um, and that'll be at 1 o'clock on Saturday. Uh, please see Joanne in the back if you, you know, get some more details or whatever. But um, I'm sure you all know that 
the majority of people who come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior come to know him as a child. It happens right back there in, in children's ministry. So if you want to be a part of bringing people into God's kingdom before he returns, get back there and help with the children's ministry. They need teachers. They need helpers, help with crafts or however you can help them back there. Please do so. It is, uh, it is such a joy, especially when the kids get to know you and they come up to you with those big hugs. It's, it's awesome. They need those hugs, too. So um, see Miss Joanne back there in the children's ministry and be at that meeting 1 o'clock on Saturday at the church um, offices. Um, let's see. Oh, s this Sunday, coming up Sunday, is no. Yes. A week from Sunday. This is this Sunday. I'll, I'll catch up. Um, next Sunday, there's going to be a meeting uh, following the service for anybody that might be interested in doing a missions trip to Panama this summer. Um, that sounds exciting, right? Did I hear oohs and ahs? All right. That sounds pretty exciting. Um, so, uh, yeah, next Sunday, immediately following service, uh, meeting for that. Um, also, regarding missions, there's a missions trip to Mexico during spring break, right the weekend right before Easter. If you're interested in that, you need to sign up by the 18th of March so that we can get all the insurance and all that stuff taken care of. So please go see it, visit our app or website, and you can sign up for the mis Mexico missions trip. For that, we got lots going on there. There's lots of people that need to need to hear about the love of Jesus, so we're trying to give you lots of opportunities. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, so um, next Wednesday will be, no, not next Wednesday, this one. <laughs> I'm not sure why I'm up here. Okay, this Wednesday, we'll back up. This Wednesday is first Wednesday of the month, which is? Okay, a couple of you know about it. For the rest of you, every first Wednesday we fast and we pray for whatever needs to be prayed for. Um, so please uh, join us. We meet right here at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday evening to pray together. And also, if you can't come, you, we can, uh, you can join with us on Zoom. The Zoom link will be on our app. It's also probably on our Facebook page. Um, let's see. So... This Wednesday, prayer and fasting. Saturday is the children's ministry meeting. Sunday is the missions meeting. You guys feeling full yet? That's just this week. Like I said, please check out the app for all the details and all this stuff. There are a couple things in the, in the little distant future that I want to let you know about so you can mark your calendars and plan on it. Uh, one of those things is our God-given gifts, gifts seminar that we like to do because it's so transforming. This is a seminar that will help you discover the gifts God has implanted in you, that he has given you. Um, we call them the motivational gifts from Romans. And um, so we like to do this seminar because it helps you to see what your strengths and weaknesses are when you discover what your gifts are, your motivational gifts are. And it also helps you to understand other people and how they operate and what their how, how they perceive things differently than you might perceive things and why. Um, it's just a really, really great seminar. How many of you have taken this seminar already? Because we try to offer it quite often since COVID. We haven't had it. So, okay, there's a few of you, so I'll expect lots of sign-ups because I didn't see all of you raise your hands. We need you to sign up as soon as possible so we can get the books ordered. So you can find, uh, you can sign up. There's a link on our on our app for that. All right, there's the the book. Um, if you'd like to just go ahead and order the book, then you can just sign up for the ten dollar one. Um, so we can uh, have that to provide lunch and snacks and and whatever other little things we need to to provide for it. But if you want to go ahead and order your book, then you can. Sign up for the lesser cost down there. Make sense? It will make sense when you go online. Okay. <laughs> I might not make sense up here, but that's why you need the app, right? Okay. Let's see. What else is coming up? I did this out of order, so now I'm all, I'm all mixed up. <laughs> 
Am I good? I think that's it. All right. I think I covered I think I covered the gist of it. If not, go to the All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so we had a membership class, a new membership class last Sunday where we um, got to um, welcome new members to our church, and I see a few of them here. So if you are here and you are at that class, would you please come up here, up front here, because we want to give you a certificate and welcome you to the Living Grace family and introduce you to everybody. Yay. Come on now. Yay, 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 yay. I, I know what they're thinking. Me? You want me to come up there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Simone, Simone has to come up too, even though Simone's been going to this church longer than I have, literally. And she's actually already a member, but... She's family. She's a, she's a re-member now. <laughs> Remix. All right, so this is Debbie. Everyone welcome Debbie. <laughs> and this is Mark. Mark, what up? Simone and Carolyn. So yeah, welcome them all to the fam church family. <coughs> <coughs> Membership has its privileges. Um, every, every team has a roster. Every um, corporation has a employee list. Every school has a, a, a list, and so Membership um, kind of helps us to um, uh, explain who we are and why we are and, and why is really important. Uh, before you decide to be a part of a church family, you need to know their why. And at our membership class, we get a chance to discuss it. And so um, uh, these people have braved that class and said, you know what, count me in. Now it's like start stacking chairs. No, I'm just playing <laughs> right on. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. We got a lot of things to say this morning. Um, everybody knows that uh, this week our, our world changed once again. Uh, Thursday I was getting ready to go head to a, a meeting in Los Angeles with a, a friend from Turkey uh, and when I got the news about the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and I just wanted to give you guys just a, I've got a video that I wanted you to watch from something that Foursquare Disaster Relief put together uh, with conjunction of our global associate director, Jeff Roper, who is over the all of Europe and the Minica region of the world. Um, and Jeff has got uh, it's just a, a few quick words. There's obviously been lots that has happened since that, just so that you know what your family, what your Foursquare family has done. Uh, we have uh, pre-positioned um, thousands of dollars in various nations to to uh, help with the refugee crisis. We're expecting over a million refugees uh, from Ukraine to be escaping into na neighboring nations uh, for help, for, for help with food and all of those kind of things. Um, I heard somebody say yesterday, and they were talking about um, kind of what has gone on, and it was like those Russian people. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait a second. I have family. Some of my dearest friends are Russians, that are Russian believers. When, when governments get into things, we don't get into the political and the governmental struggles. We are after the hearts of people, right? That, that, that's what we're after. And some of my dearest friends are R Ukrainians and Russians. And, and because governments see go, go crazy and, and do these things, doesn't mean that there's not a love for our, 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 our people, our family. That, that are really our family. So I want you guys to just watch uh, this. This is Jeff Roper again. He's the um, Global Associate Director for Europe in Minica. If you've never heard of Minica, that's uh, North, North Africa, Middle East, and Central Asia. That's, that's the region, uh, the two regions of the world that he's over. Um, so uh, Jeff gives us a few things. There is a thing on there if he's, he's talking about if you want to give, if you want to give, see me. I didn't put that all in the video. Uh, but if you want to do that to Euro Ukraine, let me know, and I will be happy to point you in the right direction for that. So uh, Jeff Roper, is, uh, watch this video real quick.
Hello, Foursquare family. Today I'm coming to you with a request for your urgent and faithful prayers for the nations of Russia and Ukraine. As you know, just hours ago, Russia invaded Ukraine, and now we're in a volatile situation that may last for weeks, may last for months, and it could even last for years. We have churches and dear friends on both sides of the border, and my heart breaks for them, and I'm asking you to join with me in praying for them. Here are four things I'm going to ask you to do if you would join me in doing these. Number one, I'm going to ask that you'd be fervent in prayer for these two nations, and that we would be praying for peace. I'm also asking that you'd be careful about what you post on social media. This is not the time to, to further our political polarization. This is not the time to advance some strange conspiracy theory about what's going on. What's going on is a war, and we need to be praying for them. This is the time to unite around the throne of God and to cry out for human beings who are suffering and dying because of this war. And so we need your prayers and even to your financial support to Foursquare Disaster Relief as we engage in working with our Foursquare Church of Ukraine to serve the people who are going to suffer the most. We are asking that Jesus would make himself great, even in the midst of this incredible suffering. So join us in prayer. Thank you very much. word from someone who's on the ground in Russia. Um, I have been to the Ukraine years ago. I was with a group of athletes that went and we preached the gospel. We ministered alongside the church. There's a strong church in Ukraine. Uh, we went into schools and preached the gospel. It was so much fun. They invited us into schools to tell them about Jesus. And we did. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was an amazing time, beautiful people, uh, amazing country, cold as all get out. I remember that going, brr. Okay, let me see. This soup is called borscht soup, and it's cold soup. No, can you heat it? Where are you from? Obviously not here. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, so we have, we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are there and uh, are suffering. And so we want to be praying for them. And um, we, um, I, I wanted to share, just before we get into the message this morning, I wanted to share a little bit um, with you out of Matthew chapter 24. Because the Bible tells us consistently uh, that, that these things are going to happen. We should not be caught off guard. Uh, we, we're going to talk this morning about about um, uh, having a sober spirit and what that means. And remember that Peter is writing to people who are experiencing great uh, persecution. And so um, Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 24. He says, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will mislead many people. And you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not alarmed, for those things must take place, but the end is not yet. Um, uh, for a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. And so we love, we love peace, we love security, we love a strong American dollar. We love a robust economy. We love it when interest rates are low and when uh, prices aren't through the roof. We like, I, I like, I'm going to talk about myself, I like all of that security. Um, I like when there's no massive war building any place in the world. Um, and yet, the Bible tells us that things will, go, will get worse and worse and worse. The Bible tells us we should not expect to have a stabilized Europe. We understand that chaos must come, that war will come and is coming, that America 
you know, it, all of the amazing attributes we have, we understand that in a geopolitical sense, in the end times, America has been dealt with. I don't mean to presume to tell you what that means, but I know this, that all of this is streaming forward to an antichrist who will rise up in the midst of war and chaos and bring peace. And all the world will, will believe that this man is, in fact, Messiah or this great leader. And so, so, so here's my point, is that we are not shocked at this. We're not surprised. Now, understand, I come from the context of a brother in Christ who is not experiencing warfare. Bullets aren't flying. Bombs aren't going off. And so our Ukrainian brothers and sisters will read Matthew 24 and go, Oh my gosh, we're right in the middle of it. Uh, but we are called, as it was said, to join them in prayer, to uh, pray for their endurance, to pray for their provision, to support them as the Holy Spirit would lead us to do that. Uh, but we're not surprised by this. We're not shocked by this. And, and uh, it, it's going to get worse. We know that. We know that Jesus said it, and it's all a part of his plan. So the other thing I want to just leave with you in this brief point is that, is that is that Jesus is still in control. God is seated on the throne. Uh, 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 Vladimir Putin or any other world leader, whoever they are, they are not operating in a vacuum without the God of the universe determining what happens, when it happens, and how it happens. Because God is sovereign over all, and he directs the affairs of the king wherever he wants. I can't always explain that. I, I can't always say, well, this, there's no easy answer to, well, if God is this, that, and the other, then why has he allowed this to happen? That's a reasonable question, and it will take some time to unpack that, not the time that we have this morning. But God is in control, and everything is streaming precisely the way that he wants it to for his purposes to be uh, unveiled and for the soon and coming eminent return of Jesus Christ when every eye will see him and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so as a follower of Jesus, we have a perspective that's a little bit different from someone that doesn't know that there's a supreme God in the universe who is literally pulling all the strings and accomplishing his purposes. So we believe in that. We believe that heaven is not caught off guard, that God's doing something. And so we need to be praying. We need to be watchful. Uh, we need to be um, a, of a sound mind and a sound spirit. We'll talk a little bit about what that means today. And that doesn't mean doom and gloom, but it means things will get worse. But Jesus is in control, and he's accomplishing his will and his purposes. Can you say amen to that? So that gives us a perspective that's a little bit different than what the news is saying, just a little bit. So I want to encourage you with that, that what we are seeing is the soon and, and coming of our risen Savior, Jesus. Uh, and all of this is a part of the plan. And so uh, it causes us to be thoughtful and prayerful for that which lies before us. Could we all stand and open in prayer this morning? Whew! I don't know about you, but I don't always know what God's up to. I know some people have the illusion that they always know what, oh, yes, this is what God's saying. And I'd be like, no, that's not what he's saying, bro. You're wrong. I don't always know. I don't know. What's God saying to you? I don't know. Oh, you don't know? No, I don't. Uh, you got a word for me, bro? Yeah, go ask God. That's my word for you. I don't know. Yeah. Uh. You know, have you ever been in some situation where you said, God, have, what are you doing, God? Why, God? This is crazy. It makes no sense. And then, you know, I say hindsight's 2010. Like you look back and you go, oh, that's why that happened. That's why. See, God, you, you took me here and you put me there and I kicked and screamed the whole way. But I get it now. And God's like, okay, thank you. Thank you for the love. Yes, Yes, creator of the universe here, you know, <laughs> understander of all mysteries. Yeah, I got you. And um, you look back even at your, 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 your mess-ups and your failures and maybe even the worst season of your life and you, and you watch God take that and transform it and use it for his glory because he takes us, 
you know, warts and all, good, bad, and ugly. And he uses all of that stuff and all that junk, and it's complicated and messy. But, you know, God loves to get into the mess of our lives. You know, some people, you'd be like, no, nah, man, you need to talk to somebody else, man. I, I don't know if I want to get involved in that. God's like, no, let me get all in your junk, man, because I love you. And we'll work it out together. Father, thank you for your word this morning in advance. Thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you, God, that we may not always know what's next, but we know who's in charge of what's next. That we, you are sovereign over the affairs of mankind. And nothing happens that doesn't go through you, Lord, that it is not... This world is not left to happen chance, uh, happenstance. It's not left to, to, the, to the pride and the, and the anger and the lust for power of man. Oh, no, Lord, because if it was up to man, this world would have, would have died out a long time ago. But you're sustaining this place, God, and you are causing your purposes and your will to be done according to your good pleasure. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Russia. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the UK. Ukraine, that God, you would strengthen them and that you would provide all that they need. Lord, you're the God who promises to meet every need, whether famine, warfare, plenty, economic highs or lows. You are our provider. Lord, would you provide for them and may they draw strength from you as you supernaturally guide and direct them and encourage them, Lord, to be bold as lions. Oh, God, we thank you, oh, God, for this opportunity to come alongside of them. And we ask you, oh, Lord, to take your word and apply it to our hearts and cause us to hear and to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Give someone a high five and have a seat if you would, please. Woo! Hey, listen, I want to remind you that uh, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday at 10 o'clock, Tuesday at 10 o'clock at Veterans Memorial in Boulder City, there is a celebration of life for Brother Walt Nyland, who went to go be with Jesus. He's a precious, precious man of God, and now he is in the presence of God, and we're like, oh, man, and uh, we will see him one day, but if you want, the family would like to invite you to go to that if you are interested in, interested in that. Hey, you know what? If you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Now, some of y'all don't even, it's like, I'll maybe address this section of the crowd. Let's try it again. If you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. The message is living in the light of his coming, all eyes on grace to come. All eyes on grace to come. It turns out that the, the prophets of old didn't always understand everything they were writing. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, they wrote things down, and you get this sense as you read what we'll read today that they kind of wrote these things as they were um, under the power and unction and leading of the Holy Spirit. They wrote these prophecies, and they wrote these things, and you get the idea that maybe every once in a while Isaiah stepped back and said, okay, how what? Like, how is that? How, how, you, no, I don't get it. Like, I don't understand. Um, one of the things that they really didn't understand is the grace of God in our lives today. They, 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 they didn't connect that. It's like, scratch the head, we don't get it. So let me ask you a question. When was the gospel first preached? When was the gospel first thought of? When did it come into the mind of God to, for, for, the, for the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and the grace of God? When did that all start? Oh, we can't think of God in times of starting and stopping. We look at a wall clock and we can say, this is what time it is, and, and then it'll be this. Time. God's not like that. God doesn't have to think up a thought because he hadn't thought of it before. No, he's always had that as part of his purposes and part of his plans. Does that make sense? We who are finite in one sense and live in a, in a time, space, continuum, worship a God who's outside of that. Like if you said, God, when did you think of the, the gospel? It's like, what are you talking about? That's always been my mind and always been my heart. And it's always something that's been a part of his process. 
But we tend to think in terms of beginnings and end. Peter answers that question. I want to remind you that Peter is talking to a group of people who are about to enter intense persecution, and some of them already have. And so there's a context here that we can pull from of how to live our lives in the worst situations and the worst times and be an encouragement to others as well. So he says this, 1 Peter 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 10, As to this salvation, the prophets prophesied of the grace that would come to you, made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels long to look at. Okay, hold on. you got to stick with me. Peter is such a theologian. Did you know this man was a fisherman? Spent three years with Jesus and was a theologian. What he just wrote is like, okay, can we take the next year and just unpack this? I mean, this is deep stuff. All right. As to this salvation, what salvation? Verse 8, Peter says this. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible And full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, as to that salvation, and let's be clear on what salvation is in case someone doesn't quite know. Salvation is the acknowledgement that you are a sinner. It is the recognition that you've broken God's law multiple times, more times than you can even think about. I've broken God's laws multiple times and sometimes broken them all at the same time. And I am guilty before God. doesn't matter how good of a person I am or how bad of a person I am or how much I give or how much I don't give or how much I hope that at the end of my life my good stuff will outweigh my bad stuff because I look in the mirror and I know me. See, you know me, but you don't really know me and I know me and I know that I got no shot if it's up to me being good because I'm not. Because just because I don't do it don't mean I don't think it. Oh, y'all are looking at me like you're judging me now, right? Come on. Um, No, I got no chance. And so because of my guilt before a holy God in which sin cannot be in his presence, he sends Jesus Christ, his only son, to live the perfect life that I cannot live, nor will I ever be able to live. He lives a perfect life. He dies because ultimately the penalty for sin is death. There's physical death, and then there's spiritual death, which is separation from God. For all eternity in a place called hell, I don't want that. And so by the grace of God, me, a guilty sinner, my eyes are open to his grace and his love. And I say, yes, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Uh, I, I need your grace. And I fall on the mercy of the high court of heaven. No, I fall on Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life died to pay like I'm on death row. Jesus had the keys to death and hell, and he opens the door and go, out you go. I'm like, what? You're kidding. I'm not going to die of spiritual separation? No, because you believe in Jesus who did die for you, rose from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and is the King of all kings, and He's the Lord of all lords, and He is my God, He is my Savior, so therefore I am saved from myself, I'm saved from my own sinful, selfish desires, I'm saved from the ultimate penalty of separation from God because of Jesus Christ. And Peter says, as to that salvation... Oh, somebody ought to say amen. I don't know. Y'all thinking you can't be loud at church? You go to that basketball game and you're loud. Come on now. Screaming at the top of my lungs. My kids are like, Dad, stop it. Ah! You know, can we come to church? And I'm not trying to legislate how you respond, but my goodness. Here we go. As to that salvation, the prophets prophesied. They, 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 
they predicted, they, they said, no, this is coming. Um, prophecy is one of the unique indicators that the Bible is in fact the Word of God and is unlike any other book ever written. 1 Peter 1, Peter says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Verse 24, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times to you. Foreordained from eternity past. And the prophets wrote about it. They didn't always understand it. There are over 300 prophecies, which are not predictions, because a prediction may or may not come true, kind of like a forecast. When you watch the news, and it's supposed to be 72, and it's 42, you're like, okay, you know, that dude's fired, man. No, 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 no. These are prophecies that come true. Over 300 that represent the soon coming King Jesus Christ, written hundreds of years, even thousands of years before his birth like the place he would be born. Micah chapter 5, verse 2 says it's going to be Bethlehem. No question. Uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 says that he would be uh, preceded by a messenger. Yeah, that was John the Baptist, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Yeah, that he would be valued at 30 pieces of silver, literally sold out, Judas did, for a political ideology, and 30 Stinking pieces of silver, which he never got to enjoy anyway. Zechariah chapter 11 says that's going to happen. His hands and feet would be pierced before anybody even understood what crucifixion was all about in Psalm chapter 22. That he would suffer death, Isaiah 53, and that he would also be given a portion with the living. And I'm sure Isaiah would be like, okay, wait a minute, he's going to be marred, his face will be marred, he, he's going to, he's going to uh, be pierced for our transgressions, the chastisement of, of our peace was upon him, and then he's alive again, and I'm sure Isaiah and went, I don't know, what? That's what Peter is saying. He'd, he would not be abandoned to the grave, nor his body see decay, Psalm chapter 16 says. So this astrophysicist named Peter Stoner, uh, a follower of Christ, uh, decided that he was going to put, you know, take out one of his many pencils in his pocket, probably had a whole pocket full, real sharp, you know, and like, hey, take it out and do some mathematical calculations and just kind of see where that, where that what, what's the real possibility? And he said this, he said, what's the probability of Jesus fulfilling just eight of these prophecies? You know, like being born in Bethlehem, like your family tree has to come from the lineage of David, and on and on and on, right? He goes, let's just pick eight. And he said, the chance of, that any one man might fulfill all of these prophecies just by happenstance or trying to make it happen or for it to actually happen, he said, would be 1 times 10 to the 17th power. Now, that's just eight prophecies. And so, uh, he, he wanted to give a visual for what that looked like. And he said, okay, he did the math. And I trust his math is accurate. <laughs> All of you mathematicians are like, Peter, stoner calculations. I'm going to check that as soon as I get home. You go for it and let me know. Right? I'm sure his scratch pad is someplace. You know. um, he said, if you take the entire state of Texas, anybody ever drove through Texas? Woo! I'm like, I'm never, ever going to get to the other side. Never. I'll be driving the rest of my life. You know, gray hair, beard, I don't know, whatever, right? <laughs> Woo! Driving through Texas, he says, take the entire state of Texas, the whole state, drop coins two feet deep over the entire area. Take one coin, mark it, and put it wherever you want in the entire state of Texas. And then he said, he said, if you take one person, blindfold them, and tell them, go wherever you want, Take as much time as you want. Pick one coin. And that coin is the one that that other person dropped someplace. That's the probability of 1 times 10 
to the 17th power. So prophecy is an important part of the Word of God. The prophets prophesied of the grace to come to you. Hebrews chapter 1 says this, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Hebrews 10.1 says the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. What does that mean? It means the prophets didn't fully understand everything they were writing. Could you imagine the prophet Isaiah reading the book of John? He'd be like, I got it. No way. This is exactly what I, this is how, oh my goodness. Could you imagine that? Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 4, speaking of this unity of the church between the Jews and the Gentile, because after all, the Jews are God's chosen people and the Gentiles, and not so much. Although there was a way for them to come to, to be a part of Israel, that, that the, 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 the mystery revealed in the New Testament is the Jew and the Gentile would be one church. Boy, isn't that a word for unity today? Ephesians 3, 4 says, As you uh, read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by His Spirit, He has revealed it to us, His holy apostles and prophets. See, God didn't reveal to them. They didn't know. Maybe you know someone who says, you know what, man, the Old Testament is all law, it's all war, it's all, you know, the, you, you know I, 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 I can't read the Old Testament, I just want the New Testament. Just the grace and the mercy of God. Oh, don't forget the justice of God. But no, I just like the red letters, that's what I love. I, I love the New Testament. Why would I want to read all that old stuff? Ooh, really? Question. Can you understand the grace of Christ without the Old Testament? You can. I believe, you, I believe if you read the New Testament, you can understand the grace of Christ. I believe that. However, I don't think you can understand your privileged position as a child of God unless you compare it to the Old Testament. You see how much the death and resurrection of Christ has afforded you. You see how you are able to experience things and understand things and grasp things that Isaiah could only dream of. Ephesians 1 verse 5 says, Having predestined us by the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. Verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Oh, the Old Testament prophets could only dream of such a relationship with God, and yet we experience it on a regular, daily, 24-7 basis. Back in 1 Peter, verse 11 says this, Seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. The grace of God, the, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. They wanted to know about the person. They wanted to know about the time. And the Lord said, no. I have this formula that I got out of this right here. The Holy Spirit predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So we have salvation equals this. It equals the grace of God that has come to you. That's the first part of 1 Peter. Plus the sufferings of Christ plus the glories to follow. Salvation is the grace that has come to you plus the sufferings of Christ or through the sufferings of Christ and through the glories to follow. Verse 12, it was revealed to them, however, that's not there, I added that, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. 
And can I say that means you? No, no, no. You today were serving, they were serving you. Not themselves, but you. In these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels long to look. The unfolding of God's eternal plan is something that angels are very interested in. This is crazy. And the scripture tells us that they are literally, in the Greek language, bending over with intense interest uh, and, and they want to learn about this thing. A Greek uh, scholar, Hybert, says this, an enduring effort to comprehend more of the mystery of human salvation. Because if you think about it, angels uh, are in His presence. They see the full power and glory of God, right? They don't need to exercise faith. Wasn't it Gabriel who said, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God? What do you mean, how can this be? <laughs> are you kidding? A woman who's a virgin to have a child? What do you mean, how can this be? And they're like, uh, we, uh, <laughs> I don't know how that, yeah, with God it's possible. They don't exercise faith. Angels don't need to be born again. They don't need to repent for their sins. They're not a part of the, the church of angels, you know, where they gather and worship. No, they're in His presence. They're in His throne. And yet they're fascinated by grace and salvation. They look at what, what you experience and they go, whoa. I mean, like, like literally bending over going, Lord, okay, that person? Wait, they're going to they're gonna do what? They're going to sacrifice for you? This person is, is going to receive you and like, like totally live their life for you? And they go, huh, I don't get it. I don't get it. It's crazy. And you know what's crazy is that the God of the universe gave us choice, a godlike characteristic, and he, he allows those that He create to choose Him or reject Him. He, he, in, the, in the creative order, everything was on display of God. We see His power. We see His mind. He speaks the stars into existence. That's uh, omnipotent. Uh, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time, and He's all the omnis. And, and yet there's one thing in the, in the amazing creative order of God that wasn't on display, and it was His grace and His mercy. So He creates human, and He says, hey, I'm going to create you. I'm going to make you in my image. As much as we love animals, they're not created in the image of God. They're still created by God, but they're not created in our image. His Spirit doesn't live within them. Animals don't have a choice. Okay, if you're a cat, maybe, but dogs, you know, they just pretty much go along with the program. So he creates humans, and he says, you, you choose. You, because love must have a choice. And in you choosing, I'm going to display my grace because you, for, for maybe all of your life, you won't receive. You'll, you'll reject me. You'll use my name in vain. You'll curse at me. You'll give me no props. You'll live your entire life as if I don't exist. And then at some point, uh, uh, something will happen in your heart. You, you, uh, I'm going to work with you in this. And I'm going to open up your eyes to my grace and my mercy. And that the fact that what Jesus did wasn't for everybody else, but it was for you. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And you're like, no way, that's for me. And, and you respond and you go, Jesus, I give you my life. I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I need you. And the angels go, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> no way. Another one. <laughs> and they can't get enough of it. Ah. <sighs> Ephesians 2, 6 and 7 puts it this way, for he raised us from the dead. This is why you're still living, by the way. That's, that's how the Bible talks. You've been raised from the dead. I remember dying. Oh, yeah. You got to die to self and be alive to Christ. What? We can explain later. <laughs> See that back table. 
plenty of information for you, and someone will be back there to explain how to be a dead man walking <laughs> or a dead woman walking. For he raised us from the dead. How many have been raised from the dead? Yeah. Woo! See, some of you literally have been raised from the dead. That's why your hand went up so fast. Some of y'all come from the other side. You came to Christ the long way. You've been raised from the dead along with Christ and seated with Him in heavenly places because we are united with Jesus Christ. Why? Verse 7, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness towards us as shown in all He has done for us who are united with Christ here in, 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 on earth you are the object lesson of God's grace in heaven. And one day, all for the ages to come, it's like, grace? You want to talk about grace? Where do you think all these people came from? <laughs> oh, the grace of God is the object lesson in heaven throughout all of eternity. Ah, now... Peter changes gears, and he says, let's get to some application now. Having said all that, how does it apply to our lives? He says this in verse, chapter 1, verse 13, therefore, everybody say therefore. therefore. And whenever you see a therefore, you got to know what it's therefore. therefore. Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Set your heart, hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Therefore, application time. Class is open. The first couple of uh, uh, verses have all been about what God has done for us and who we are because of what God has done. Now Peter shifts gears and says, yo, yo, come on, man, tighten your shoelaces. Now comes some application. Here's the one thing I want to remind you. When you read the Bible, don't just read application. Well, what do I have to do? Well, what do you want? Okay, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do that. Because you can become a little bit legalistic and you can forget relationship. When I was a new believer in Christ, it was all about application. Don't do this. Do that. Don't go here. Can't do this. Don't. And it was like I was missing, though I was thankful for the grace of God in my life, I was missing the growth in just a true loving relationship with him. Come on, don't just go to application. Don't miss the relationship part. So having said that, therefore... Drawing on what was previously said, you've been chosen, you've been sanctified by the Spirit, you've been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ, you've been born again to a living hope, you've obtained an inheritance that is uh, uh, protected and undefiled in heaven, reserved for you in heaven, protected by God's power. You've got a privileged position in Christ in the dimension of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, <laughs> woo! therefore, there, ah, now, now, now he says, uh, prepare your minds for action. Gird up the loins of your mind. Peter says, get your mind right. Because if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Thank you, this side over here. <laughs> get your mind right. Oh, if you weren't with us for the five or six weeks, we did a series on the mind. Man, I'll do it again if y'all want, because it was great. Prepare your minds for action. Another translation says, gird up the loins of your mind. Oh, I'm going to get my mind right. We're living in the end times. There's chaos all around us. It's going to get worse. And when Peter wants to instruct the church who is suffering and will be suffering even more, he says, yo, 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 this is who you are in Jesus. Now get your mind right. Set your mind on things above, not on things of earth, Paul said to the church at Colossae. Gird up your mind. What does that mean? Not gear up, gird up. To gird up your mind is back in the day they had long flowing robes. 
you know, everybody had their robe, you know, hey, what's up, man? Oh, like that robe. Hey, what up, man? Just had it made, man. <laughs> Went came down from the shop over on the other side. Got my nice Babylonian robe. Oh, you rocking the Babylonian robe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Woo! You could tell how, how uh, where somebody's uh, status or where they wanted their status to be by how long their robe was. Oh, he got a long robe. Yeah, man, he rocking it tonight, boy. Woo! He must be going down to Corinthian. <laughs> so you had the long flowing robe, right? But every once in a while, somebody was chasing your, your behind. So what do you have to do? You listen, you can't, you can't be running in a row. I, suge- I don't, uh, you know, and I don't know what some of y'all are going to do. You're going to go home, dig out that old robe, and try to run in it. Okay, it's not the same. It's not the same. <laughs> just, uh, I want to see pictures uh, on YouTube or something. I don't know. Just post it on Instagram for all of us to see. Say, you know, my man running in his robe. Woo! What, are y'all, what is your church doing? Well, we're doing a fundraiser. It's the robe run. We're girding up the loins. We're girding up our loins, and we're going to run around the city. Okay. And you're wearing robes. Yeah, it's going to be cool, man. You want to support me? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and that person's going to do what? Go home and put a robe on and try to run on it. Yeah, that's, I, know it I know how that goes. Gird up the Lord, the, 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 it means to take the back end of that robe and to, and to hold it, right? So you can, uh, you can, you can get some giddy up, you can move, uh, you, could, you could juke somebody, you know? You got to hold on to that robe, right? You see the same sort of thing when brothers have their pants sagging and they'd be like, oh, I got to go, I got to go. And they hold them up. That's the same thing, you're girding up their loins, it's, it's okay. By the way, if you're a sagger, we want you to know we love you, you're welcome here. Everyone's welcome, saggy belt, no belt, whatever. <laughs> I was at a UNLV game last night, man, and the dude was just giving over to give a hug to somebody and was like, all underwear. And I promise you, if I was sitting behind him, I would have said, boy, pull your pants up. What's wrong? Nobody want to see your jockeys. Anyway, it's just me. I'm not judging. I'm trying to keep it real, yo. Gangster, you know. Listen, and when you were going to war, you had to put that belt on. You had to put that belt on, the belt of truth, because you can't be hindered. You can't be tripping and slipping all over the place. Man, you showed up to war, man, you got a robe on. What's your problem, man? What? I'm ready, man. Go home. <laughs> Please, leave us. You got to gird up, gird up your mind. Get your thinking straight. Um. The right kind of thinking at the right time. You got to be ready for action. You got to be ready now for what's coming. Uh, you don't always have time to get ready in the moment, so you got to be ready now. How? You got you to set your mind on things above. You got to prepare your minds for action. Don't be caught spiritually asleep when Christ returns. Jesus said, Let your loins be girded up and, and keep your lamps alight. Uh, we live in a hostile world, but as followers of Jesus, we don't panic. Now, please, context again. We are not, I'm not speaking to you from a basement with, in a bunker with bombs going off all around. So I can't, I can't speak to you in that context. But we do live in a hostile world, and we're told not to panic, not to be distracted. It's, it's easy to do when you're persecuted. It's easy to do when the world is falling apart. And, and, and Peter would say to us, man, prepare your minds for action. Prepare your minds for action because you're in it, man. You're in it now. You can't back up. You can't, you can't try to duck and dodge and get out of the way. It's about to happen. And some of you might already be in it. You might go, yeah, that's me, man. I get it. So you know what? Prepare your mind because the battle, the turf, for the spiritual warfare that we, exta- uh, that we experience is in our mind. We have ruts. We have strongholds. We have ways of thinking that we've thought over and over and over and over and over again. And it's like the old, wagon, the old wagon's going through the desert and it creates a, a, a track that it can't get out of. But, but God would say, you know what? No, don't think like that. Renew your mind. Uh, listen to what I tell you. I, I'm, I'm, this whole book is about who I am and who I want you to be and how I want you to think about who I say that you are. Don't believe what they say. Don't believe what your mind tells you. Don't believe what the enemy tells you because he will always lie. The devil can't speak the truth, and if he does speak the truth, he lies about it. So you got to renew your mind, redeem your mind, 
through the Word of God. Romans chapter 12, 2 Corinthians 10 says, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is an ongoing battle. Don't lose the war of your mind. Don't let your mind take you places the Word of God hasn't, doesn't want you to go. So you have to guard your heart and guard your thinking. Number one, prepare your minds for action. Get your mind right. Number two, keep sober in spirit. We're almost done. Hang on. Keep sober in spirit. Steadfast, self-discipline, spiritually and morally alert. Be sober of spirit. Most of us could probably testify to what it is to have had too much to drink or some other substance, whatever. We could probably say, yeah, here's what happens when you are inebriated. We could probably testify to that. And Peter says, be sober in your spirit. Steadfast. Be serious. Use your mind to evaluate what you see before you. Use the Word of God to, evaluate, to, to be the filter through which your mind thinks, to which you see the world. Don't be caught off guard by the philosophy of the world. Colossians 2.8 says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. I like how it says pseudo-intellectual babble according to the traditions or mere musings of men following the elementary principles of this world rather than following the truth, the teachings of Christ. Don't be caught off guard. Set your mind on things above. Don't let the new thing in the church try to sway you and drag you. Oh, you got to go to this conference. Oh, you got to go, go see this. You got to read this person's book. You know what? We're filled with entertainment in the church. And I'm not against those things. There's a men's conference coming into town called the Altar Men's Conference. Derek Carr, you might know him. He's a quarterback for our team, the Raiders. Everybody just look at me and smile. Oh, he's your brother in Christ. Y'all hating on a brother? You need to repent right now. <laughs> oh, you was rooting for the other team? I'm sorry. I, I, I. He's a brother in Christ. He's doing a conference at the Thomas and Matt called the Altar Men's Conference. And by God's grace, there'll be 18,000 men there giving it up for Jesus, yelling and screaming and acting a fool. I hope so. So I'm not opposed to those things. But there's new things that come, and there's new teachings, and oh, this person, and oh, that, and we raise up these people to stardom, and it's not right. It's not right. And when they fall, it's like, oh, no. Well, did they have accountability? We don't know. Oh, well, were they, in, in, were they did anybody check them on their doctrine? No, we really didn't. We just really loved their message, and their delivery was so spot on. Whatever. Whatever. And John would say this in 1 John 4, Beloved, don't believe every spirit speaking though through a self-proclaimed prophet. Instead, test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets and teachers have gone out into the world. And I say to you, the closer and closer and deeper we get into the end times, watch for more and more and more false prophecy. Watch out. Don't get caught up into that. Keep sober in spirit. You might be the only person to say, hold up, hold up. Is it just me? But something ain't right here. You be that person. So we're almost done. Hang on. Prepare your minds for action. Gird up the loins of your mind. Keep sober in spirit and set your hope completely on grace. Completely. What's your hope based on? We've been talking a lot about hope because Peter has a lot to say about it. Oh, set your hope completely on grace. Verse 13, set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fix your hope. Hebrews 12 speaks about the runner running down the track and how they have to stay focused. Be focused on that, on that prize. Focus for us on Jesus. He says, therefore we also, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, including the angels, we know the angels are in the stand going, you go, boy, you go. Sacrifice, give, give it up for Jesus. Woo! <laughs> Encouraging angels. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. They're ministering spirits sent to us. We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race set before us. How? Looking to Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Oh, man, did you hear about that? No, man, uh-uh. 
Uh, well, hey, are you going to go do it? No, man, uh-uh, no. What are you doing? I'm running a race, man. I got my eyes fixed on Jesus. I'm not going to get swayed back and forth. I'm not going to start looking around and see if anybody's next to me or behind me. No, I got my eyes on Jesus. I ain't got time for all that madness and all that nonsense. Let, let us run the race of endurance set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Oh, aren't you glad he started it? And aren't you glad he'll finish it? See, that's the cross of Jesus Christ, isn't it? Instead of imitating an ungodly world, I will produce, fourthly, instead of imitating an ungodly world, I will produce the character, the holy character of God. Oh, holiness. Holiness. Woo! Not a foreign concept if you're a follower of Christ. It means to be consecrated. Uh, it, it means <coughs> to be set apart. Um, Peter says, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Don't be conformed to that. Don't be, don't be, you were, you were ignorant. You didn't know. I mean, you knew it was wrong because your conscience told you it was wrong, but you didn't care. Because everybody else was doing it, or it felt good, or it made you money, or whatever you want to call it. But, but spiritually, you were ignorant, but you knew it was wrong, but you were spiritually ignorant. He, and Peter says, you know what? Don't be conformed to that. But, like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior because it's written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Holiness. <laughs> Striving for holiness. I'm running that race. I'm trying to say yes to the things God has me say yes to. I'm trying to say no to the things God has me say no to. I'm not trying to just go with the flow. I'm not trying to, it feels good, man, seem right. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm trying to be holy. I'm trying to live a holy life so that others can see the distinction between those who are living a holy life and those who are not. So that they would look and say, there's something about you that's different like, how come you're not just going crazy like everybody else is? Why are you are so strange? Yeah, well, I'm trying to live this holy life, and I got my eyes fixed on Jesus. I'm trying to prepare my mind for action. I'm keeping my, so, my, my spirit sober, and, and I'm setting my hope com uh, completely on the grace to come. Amen. Holiness is not sinless perfection. It's not being free from sin, but being free from the domination of sin. Holiness is not being free from sin because I'm going to sin. Uh, sorry you knew that when you married me. Hmm. <laughs> but it is freedom from the domination of sin. Separation, consecration, devotion to Christ for service to him. So 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this. So all of us have that veil removed, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Whew. I'm a work in process. How about you? God's not done with me yet, and He won't be done with me until I see Him face to face. I'm not the man that I used to be, and I'm striving to be everything that God wants me to be, but it's a process. Please be patient with me. It's hard work. It's hard work, this holiness thing. It's not easy. But by his grace and by his power and by his mercy, I'm going to look a little bit more like Jesus tomorrow than I did today. Amen. And then the next day, I'm going to look a little bit more like Jesus. And I'm not trusting the process. I'm trusting the one who designed the process. I'm, trust, I'm trusting the one who's in charge of the process. I get the, the phraseology, trust the process, man. Now, why would I trust the process when I can trust the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords who's in charge of all processes? <laughs> uh, and all the English majors said, what? <laughs> Holiness. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we surrender this day to you. We surrender this time to you. It is a moment in time, God. It is a moment in time. Lord, we don't, we, we don't, we don't take one minute for granted not one, because we believe in a nanosecond you can change our eternal destiny. And it's not something that happens at a point in time. It's something that you have been doing throughout all eternity, and you've been working in our lives from the time we were born. That today, God, 
today would be the day where we surrender to you. Today would be that day that we acknowledge our sinfulness and run to you, whether for the first time or we repent in our own lives. Lord, your grace, may your grace be on full display in our hearts. We thank you, God, that you didn't talk, kick us to the curb, like, you know what, man, this just ain't working. You never do that. <laughs> but you get all up in our mess, and you use it all to transform us into your image that we might use our mess for your glory. And we thank you. We thank you, God. Father, I pray for these precious people here this morning that you would pour out a blessing on them that they would not be able to grasp it all. I pray for a blessing that would overflow. Jesus, you said out of our innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But you were speaking of the Holy Spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence among us and within us. We thank you for the conviction that you bring. And we thank you that you would lead us and guide us in, our, in the core of who we are to be more like Jesus. Thank you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, I'd like to say to you, uh, amen, guys. I'd like to say to you, we have communion elements here. You know, sometimes you just need to respond, not to what I said, but to what God's saying in your heart. And it might sound a little hokey, like, pfft. I remember when they used to do the altar call. I'd be like, whatever, dude, I'm not going up there. I'm not going up there. Why do I have to walk up there? Why do I have to laugh? Anyway, you know, I'm Mr. Rebellion. No, raise your hand. Nope, not doing that either. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. But sometimes you, you just, if the Holy Spirit would lead you, we have communion here. This is our covenant meal, and you might just want to come and have a quiet moment with God and renew your covenant with Him. Uh, Make it a special thing, I guess, because every, every, every moment in Christ is special, and we're blessed to have them. And so um, if you want to know more about what it means to walk with Jesus, Brother Jesse's back in the back. He would love to uh, talk to you about that because um, it takes one another to grow in this thing like you can't really grow as a christian without other christians you know it's like okay i'm an army of one no you're not you're gonna die <laughs> um, bad slogan but uh, jesse would love to meet with you and pray with you also if you're visiting we have something for you god bless you guys we'll see you on wednesday night